This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Hello, I'm Evan Lee, and welcome to the latest in a series of interviews called Legally Speaking, a co-production of the California Lawyer Magazine and UC Hastings. Legally Speaking is a series that we refer to as conversations with the most interesting lawyers in the world. And today's most interesting lawyer is United States Senator Russ Feingold, a three-time senator from the state of Wisconsin, Senator, welcome to Legally Speaking. Thank you, Evan. Thank you for the kind words. It's good to be on the show. I just want to talk a little bit about, um, I, I want to start first um, with something that's very recent. Um, as we sit here today, the, uh, the tragedy of the Boston Marathon is still fresh in our minds. And I want to ask you, what, is, what, what do you think the takeaway is? from that bombing. Is there a takeaway? Well, there's going to be many takeaways. Um, and, you know, this is a, a really fascinating as well as horrible incident because when those of us that talk to each other regularly were waiting to find out who had done it, I actually made people guess whether it was international or domestic. Because as I indicated in my book, we've been through this before. A lot of people thought uh, when the Oklahoma City bombing occurred, there was an assumption that a lot of people made that it was a, uh, an extreme Islamic group of some kind from around the, the world. On the other hand, there have been some domestic actions like this. The interesting thing about this one is it almost was like a hybrid of the two. And so it's hard for people to kind of make these distinctions, and it's very challenging for our society to be a society that not only does welcome immigrants, but should welcome immigrants. But to also sort of tie that in with the dangers around the world that we don't even really understand. That's why I call my book, While America Sleeps. People, including me for a very long time, don't know where Mali is. They didn't know where Somalia is. To me, that incident in Boston has a lot to do with issues of civil liberties and what the proper power of the government is and how we treat immigrants and all those issues. But to me, at the, at the very core, it's that we have not turned the page. We have not made the step we need to make since 9-11 to really have a firmer grasp on what's going on in the rest of the world. And I think it's very dangerous. Toward the end of the book, um, you talk about um, an aide calling you up uh, and saying, Osama bin Laden has just been killed. And you talk about some of the aftermath of that, some of the pronouncements, uh, the war on terror is over, uh, Al-Qaeda is dead, Al-Qaeda is irrelevant, and you, you don't seem happy with those pronouncements. You see, it seems as if you feel that those are dangerous. Could you explain that? That's right. Um, I was writing the book starting in January of 2011. And in the middle of writing the book, I got a call from a staff member, which normally I ask them not to call me too late at night because I'm an early bird sleeper, early, early to get up the next day. But he called me at 10, 30, 11 o'clock and said, I know I don't usually do this, but the president's going to make an announcement about bin Laden. So of course, I was pleased to hear the announcement, as was every American. But then I saw pronouncements from Brennan and from even my friend Leon Panetta, who I think is a wonderful guy, essentially saying, hey, we, al Qaeda's decimated. But I knew better because I was on the Foreign Relations Committee, on the Intelligence Committee, and I had made it my focus on both committees to be very focused on Africa and particularly Northern Africa. So in the book, before any of this happened, I'm already talking about Somalia, I'm talking about Algeria, 
Al Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb, which is the group that went down to Mali. And I, I actually warn in the book, uh, at the same time that these pronouncements are being made, pay attention to Northern Africa. Of course, I didn't know that what was going to happen with Gaddafi, and I didn't know, uh, although that was starting to happen, I didn't know what was going to happen uh, in terms of Mali. Uh, I did warn about Nigeria, which is a very serious issue, the Boko Haram group there. But yeah, we, we have a tendency, uh, I call it the, in the book, the game of risk. We have a tendency to sort of look at one country at a time like we're playing Can risk. Can you just explain that a little yeah. bit? I mean, yeah. we, all, we all played risk, the, the board yeah. game. You're talking about the board yeah, game. Yeah, I don't right. know if it's a perfect analogy, but in the game of risk, you know, the goal, of course, is to take over the world, and I'm not saying that's the goal of these folks, but when you take over a country, you, you have to leave your troops there the whole... You have whole, to leave at least one army. You have to leave that's an the army there. The game. You have to leave yeah. an army there. And to me, it kind of reminded me of the way that we think of one country at a time. So it was Afghanistan, right? That was where, how we're going to deal with an organization that even the president said was in some 60 countries, and yet it was all about Afghanistan. Then, it, almost insanely, President Bush decides that we should take over Iraq, even though Iraq wasn't even on his list, and that was supposedly about al-Qaeda. And then one of the quotes I have in the book is when we had to deal with the al and the situation in Yemen, Joel Lieberman says, well, it looks like it's gonna be Yemen now instead of Iraq and Afghanistan. In other words, we seem to have an uh, in, incapability to think about the interrelationships of places. The fact that I once asked a staff member, I said, how far is Yemen from Somalia? Because there's water there. I thought maybe it would be 1,000 miles, Red Sea. Turns out it's 20 miles. From the tip of Yemen from to the, the tip, tip of From Somalia. the Horn of Africa to Yemen. Now, you could almost swim it. Of course, the sharks might have other ideas for you, but we think of, here's Africa, here's the Middle East, mm -hmm. and never the train shall, twain shall meet. It, it's closer to Palo Alto from here. And, and yet we are not able to think about those interconnections, and I think that, that, is, that is what bothered me about the statements that were being made. It showed a lack of understanding about the chapters of Al-Qaeda and similar groups that exist in many places around the world. I don't think it's like they're fully effective, but they're plotting to do things. And even though I'm a progressive, mm -hmm. and even though I led the fight against the Iraq war and led the effort to get us out of Afghanistan after a while, it's foolish to think that this uh, organization is decimated. I don't think they are. I think they're still a threat. Is it just Al Qaeda? No. Or, or are there, I mean, or, or, or Al Qaeda affiliates? Is it all? Are those the only real, quote unquote, terroristic threats to the United States, or are there others? Well, that are, they're I, not really affiliated. I, I try to avoid thinking of it as terrorist groups because that's so broad. There is a a constellation of organizations that are, you know, once or twice removed. There's Al Qaeda. Then there are formal affiliates of Al Qaeda, mm -hmm. such as uh, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, such as Al Qaeda in the, in the Islamic Maghreb. Uh, and perhaps Boko Haram, this organization in, in Nigeria. So there, many of them have actually said we're chapters of Al-Qaeda. But then there are other groups that are inspired by Al-Qaeda. Uh, groups that, that take steps that may be the thing that happened in Libya, that's unclear. That may have been Al-Qaeda, it may have been a, a group that's merely sympathetic, who admire the ideology of Al-Qaeda. And then, then there's this sort of copycat thing that is, doesn't even necessarily involve a sophisticated adoption of an ideology. It might have the people that decided to try to kill people in Times Square. Uh, originally they thought that those that tried to bring down the 10 uh, British airplanes coming to the United States, it was a plot a few years ago, they thought they were just homegrown uh, people in England, Islamic, but they thought that they were copycats. Turned out they were actually directed out of Waziristan. But yeah, it's at all those levels. And we make a huge mistake if we only analyze this based on the leadership of Al-Qaeda in uh, Western Pakistan. It's more difficult and more dangerous than that. And frankly, when we use drones in a way that is reckless uh, and isn't careful about our targets, you start growing additional people who have the sentiments that can lead to this kind of action in a place like Pakistan, in a place like Yemen. But if the sequential, you know, sort of as you've analogized it to the game of risk, the sequential, you know, we move to this country, then we move to this country, and our focus is entirely on this country. If that's not a good approach because Al-Qaeda and other groups are spread, are, are so far flung, how do you approach that? I mean, when you say 60 countries, I mean, that's almost inconceivable that we could deal yeah. with that. 
Well, that's what my book's about. I mean, the first thing is, it, it seems inconceivable if the way a person thinks about it is we have to invade those countries. That's not the answer. Almost every country in the world doesn't want Al-Qaeda there. Who wants Al-Qaeda around? I mean, they'd be happy to kill Islamic leaders that they don't like. You know, they're not exactly, uh, you know, tolerant of anybody. Mm -hmm. And so they're an enemy of almost every country. So the notion that we have to use military force as a first resort, drones or any other tactic, when many of these countries want to work with us to control this problem is a mistake in the first place. Secondly, we don't really have the resources, not just military, but intelligence, diplomatic and others, to really know what's happening in some of these places. I keep referring to Nigeria because I had an incident in 2001, just prior to 9-11 that I describe in the book, where we went up to a town called Kano, K-A-N-O. Kano is a very large Islamic city in, in northern Nigeria. It's sixth or seventh largest Islamic city in the world. I didn't know what it was. How many Americans know what it is? Well, it's on the ancient Islamic trade routes that go back a thousand years, all the way from the Middle East, all the way to Timbuktu. It's an area that's heavily affected by fundamentalist Islam. And when we were on the streets there, we had no diplomatic presence there. We were there with one of our embassy people. We didn't have a consulate. We saw kids on the street in early 2001, not only with Qaddafi t-shirts and postcards, but bin Laden. And that was a long, long way away from Afghanistan. So I asked my staff if they could get me a briefing about this when we got back, because that wasn't our reason for being there. And she worked hard to get it, and as I say in the book, sometimes it takes time for things to get done in Washington. The briefing was scheduled for September 13th, 2001. So needless to say, yeah. there were a few other things being briefed at that yeah. time. So the problem is, is that we lack the knowledge of other places. Um, <laughs> when I was teaching law at Marquette University Law School, I picked up a copy of the Marquette Tribune, the undergraduate newspaper. Mm -hmm. And a young man who was a senior, I think at the time, had written a little column during the Arab Spring entitled, Where in the World is Tunisia? And I, I you know, kind of got a kick out of it. And he said there, you know, why is it I'm a good student? Why don't I even know where this place is? Is it an important ally? Why, why is it he wrote that we know more about uh, Kardashian than we do about Kyrgyzstan? You know, it was a very thoughtful little piece. And then you realize we don't have the foreign languages. We don't have the capacity as a people or as leaders to, to know a lot of the key languages around the world. So not only so we can talk uh, to, our, to understand, uh, intercept things from our enemies, but as we found out as, uh, in this country in World War II, we didn't even have the capacity to communicate with our allies. And that's why the Defense Department set up the Defense uh, Language School in this area because of the lack of language capacity. And we're not present in other countries as a people in the way that many other countries are more adept, such as the Russians, the Chinese. We tend to be here, we love it here, it's far away, and we lack the presence that would allow us to pick up information we need to understand problems before they occur. So this isn't about invading countries. It's about understanding what's going on in them and then working in a strategic way if we identify people that are part of Al-Qaeda, obviously, to go after them, which we have done more effectively in a place like Indonesia than we have in Northern Africa. Well, if I read the thesis of the book correctly, I mean, I mean it is sort of uh, about invading, but not invading with armies. It's invading with civilians. It's invading with... It's about uh, being present. The, the Peace Corps. It's about letting, letting people from those countries know about us, to be here. Here's an illustration of it. Yes, it's about being there and having people feel that Americans are there and that they're positive in a place, let's say, Indonesia. Fourth largest country in the world, largest Islamic country in the world, but it, it goes another direction. All over this country, not just in a cosmopolitan place like San Francisco, but all over the country. There are all these communities of people from these countries, Ethiopians, Somalis, Russians, Iranians, there's a lot of relationships and information that is available right here in this country, but the connections to these communities in a positive, information-friendly way doesn't exist very much within this country. So it's not just a question of going there, it's also trying to establish those links here. Uh, I think that's part of it as well. Uh, would you say that the word outreach captures a lot of what you're talking about? Outreach, both internationally and domestically. And domestically. But not in sort of a, you know, soft kind of way only. I mean, you know, sometimes it, yes, much of it would be positive. Much of it would be simply giving 
understanding Islam, showing people that you care about the, the beautiful aspects of the religion and, and having that. But at the same time, we have to have adequate intelligence capacity. Uh, we don't have a proper intelligence uh, presence in many parts of the world because many of the resources were drained into Iraq and Afghanistan. This uh, sort of one country at a time or two country at a time approach really eliminated a lot of the critical intelligence resources. And, and you know, one thing I did really develop a strong understanding for on the Intelligence Committee is I might have been somewhat skeptical about the need for uh, these kind of folks before I went on the committee and changed my mind. We, we need to know what's going on. This is a very complicated world where things aren't always as they appear. And, and there are all kinds of games being played between countries and it would be naive for us to not make a commitment to intelligence as well as military, as well as diplomatic. And is that resource shortage uh, just monetary or is it also a, a lack of human resources, a lack, going back to this Definitely lack of human stuff. resources, lack of capabilities in terms of language, lack of coordination of military, intelligence and diplomatic information. A great example of this was the so-called Christmas uh, Day bomber or attempted bombing mm -hmm. when he tried to blow up the plane coming into Detroit. One of the reasons we didn't catch that thing in advance in the way we should have was that there was information throughout the government that if, it, if the dots had been connected, you know, in the old FBI, CIA thing, we might have gotten ahead of it. We knew that something was going, that somebody was co coordinating with uh, al Awlaki on the intelligence side in Yemen. But there also was information about this guy and his family, his dad was a prominent Nigerian on the diplomatic side, on the State Department side. If these dots, and he was living in London, you know, so the, if these different things could be put together, if you only think what's going on in Yemen with this one Al-Qaeda guy, you don't have it. So it's coordination, it's human resources, it's monetary resources, and it's the right focus. We tend to put everything, all the eggs in one basket, and that's why uh, Northern Africa was heavily, seriously under-resourced uh, in terms of our intelligence operation and others at the time uh, of the Arab Spring. I'd like to change the subject uh, slightly, staying with foreign relations, but uh, moving to your uh, very prominent criticism of the invasion of Iraq. Um, I'm going to read from a March 20th uh, kind of photo essay or photo retrospective um, in The Atlantic, um, and, and very briefly, it says, in the eight years between invasion and withdrawal, more than 110,000 people suffered violent deaths as, uh, as direct result of the Iraq conflict. Some estimates put that number at over a million. Hundreds of thousands of civilians and former combatants also suffered injury during the war both physical and psychological. When the coalition finally withdrew in 2011, no significant weapons of mass destruction had been located, but Saddam Hussein's regime had been replaced by elective representatives. A mostly Sunni-led insurgency flared up, challenging the new government and security forces. Trillions of dollars were spent, and millions of lives were affected but the Iraqis are still struggling to find their post-war footing as near constant violence hampers any efforts to move beyond poverty and pain. Is the United States strategically better off now than before the invasion? I think it's a dubious proposition and if you talk to the leaders of Sunni countries uh, excuse me, of Shia, uh, Sunni countries, yes, mm -hmm. in the Middle East. We've helped create a new dynamic that we're seeing in Syria, which is there's an enormously higher level of tension between the Shia and Sunni uh, Muslim countries. As I mentioned in the book, when I visited uh, King Abdullah in Jordan with John McCain, he wanted to explain to us what his concern was. He said, we fear the Shia crescent. And he made motion with his hand and talked about not only Iran, but now a lot of the power in, in Iraq, Shia populations in, in his own country, Shia populations in, in Syria. And we know Iran is a very threatening country in many ways. So in a way, what we did was 
<laughs> in effect, empower Iran. Not, that's not to say I'm not glad Saddam Hussein's gone. I am. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the Middle Eastern geopolitics and the, and the international geopolitical situation, we may have created a worse situation than a better one, apart from the absurdity of going into a place that wasn't connected with Al-Qaeda and there weren't weapons of mass destruction. Even if it would have been a good idea in the sense of being better off in the future, we don't have the right to just go invade countries on our own without working more closely with the international community, even in a situation like that. So uh, there, at many levels, I, it's very hard to suggest that this was the right thing to do or it's lucky we did it. It's not lucky we did it, it was a mistake uh, and there should be far more accountability for the fact that it was done dishonestly and inappropriately. One of the things that you're most famous for, uh, aside from the obvious, which we will get to, but my golf game? Uh, no, <laughs> it's uh, something not, else. Uh, definitely not the case. Um, is um, the the distinction of being the only member of the United States Senate to vote against the USA Patriot Act, and um, my question is, electorally, what were you thinking? I mean, it worked out, but. Doesn't every fiber of the politician in you, and you have to be a politician to get to, to rise to the level that you were at, doesn't every fiber tell you, I mean, Paul Wellstone voted for it, didn't he? Yes. Well, I know it's hard to believe this, but people that are in politics are not only politicians in most cases. We have other aspects of our humanity. I certainly do. I'm thrilled to have been a state senator and a United States senator, but that's not who I am. And I, I found that out after I lost, uh, the, how happy I am and how much I'm enjoying every other aspect of life. Normally, I suppose I was operating as a person that was both policy-oriented and certainly politically oriented. I like winning better than losing. But 9-11 hit me in a very different way. It took me out of politics for a while. I thought to myself, this is why we're here. Moments like this occur. Very few people are ever around for a moment like this. It's a sacred obligation to just try to get it right. And I didn't think that my being reelected had anything to do with anything anymore. I was so overwhelmed by the brutality of the act. And, uh, you know, I have children and family and friends, and I heard all the stories. I didn't care about the politics of it. I was interested in getting it right. For me, getting it right was making the right calls about Afghanistan, making the right calls about not compromising the Constitution unnecessarily. So I both wanted to get the people that attacked us, but I also didn't want us to compromise their values. That's what was motivating me. So I remember the moment when I voted. I honestly didn't think about or care one bit what it meant Anybody in your stra staff try to talk you out of it, say, yeah, yeah, think about your future, Senator? They were wonderful. They were proud that we were taking this step. They were there working for us for the right reasons. No, they didn't. We only were trying to guess if I'd be the only one. And we, eh, a few of us got a little pale at times realizing we might be the only one. And we didn't know until the last minute that they were going to call the bill the USA Patriot Act. So, you know, I might have gulped a little bit when I went down there and knew I'd be the only one. And I figured it would be, you know, once I sort of got back to Milwaukee, I thought, oh, it'll be interesting to start going to events now. And it was amazing. I've never been praised more for anything I've done in my life, and I was sort of surprised. From conservatives, from liberals, there was just this thank you. Thank you for telling us we can still be Americans. Thank you for telling us you can still disagree after 9-11. It was a fascinating thing, and to this day, when I'm introduced, I've gotten standing ovations in my introduction when they mention this, and then no standing ovations for my speech. <laughs> you know, it's just it's all that, downhill from there. Yeah, it's all done totally good. hard to top. But I, I didn't. I, I guess if I thought about it, I thought I, there may be hell to pay on this later on. But I was thinking about what had happened, and the people that had been killed, and how we prevent it. And you know, that's what, just what was motivating me. What would it have taken in terms of amendments? Oh to that bill that would have allowed you to have voted for it? Well, I offered, I tried to offer those amendments. I write about this in my book. It's called An Old Wish List of the FBI. That was Bob Novak's characterization of the bill, conservative columnist. 
There were a list of things that the FBI shoved in the bill because they knew it was going to pass that they never could get otherwise. Things like expanding sneak and peek searches of people's houses without a search warrant to long periods of time on the ground that it was for terrorist situations and it wasn't even used for terrorist situations for two years. Allowing uh, the FBI to go after people's uh, library records without any discretion of the court to say no, without any proof that they'd done anything bad in terms of terrorists, just that they were interested in the information. And so you I, found out that the librarian lobby was actually pretty strong. There, I knew that one before. Don't mess with the librarians. Don't it's mess a good, with the librarians. It's a dumb thing to do. Um, but I had a list of, you know, we probably had a list of 12 things. Uh, the House actually was moving in the right direction, fixing those things, working with the ACLU. Um, but then the process got shut down by a Democratic Senate and the administration working together to prevent me from changing it at all. And uh, that was unforgivable and was not the right process. It was fixable. We needed a law. We needed an update on some of these things. But it was a, it was a grab, grab bag situation for people who wanted to expand the powers of the federal government to situations that had very little to do with 9-11. True or false, Democrats have largely given the Obama administration a pass in terms of civil liberties and national security. True. If not me, but if your old truth. if if your old friend Barack Obama called you up and said, "You're killing me with this." So tell me, what would you do differently? If you're you're sitting in my you're sitting in my chair now, what would you do differently? Well, first I'd say, Mr. President, you know I'm not killing you. You're doing you're doing fine, and uh, this isn't the kind of issue that's gonna you know prevent you from having a, a successful second term. I would remind him of the things we did together in the Senate, where he was one of my best allies on things like making sure that the phone companies were liable for uh, giving away information that they shouldn't have and warrantless wiretapping on torture, on Guantanamo, on trying to stop the USA Patriot Act from being renewed until it was fixed. Barack Obama was a, a great help on all those things. He also is a constitutional lawyer who knows that the aggrandizement of the Second Amendment, uh, of, of the uh, Article Two of the United States Constitution. That's a different, con oh, that's I a know. different conversation. I'm happy to talk about yeah, that too. That's right. Uh, Article Two of the United States Constitution, overriding essentially the Article One that has to do with Congress, uh, that this is a grotesque uh, change of the Constitution against Justice Jackson's uh, warnings in the steel seizure case, and that it's one thing for the Bush administration to do this, but that if Barack Obama doesn't change it, then it kind of gets baked into the Constitution. So if I had the chance, I would plead with him to, it's still early in his second term, to take those steps. But isn't that the point, though, that it's really about the office? It's not so much about the man as it is about the office. There's something about being in the Oval Office and surrounded by the top brass of the Pentagon and being in a bubble, really. Being I mean, in a I, bubble I, where all the pressures are enormous and they're all pushing one way. I mean, how, I mean, would that's right. President Feingold really be able Who to knows? withstand it, those? It would be arrogant of me, A, to think of me as president and B, to think that I could resist the, these pressures. I don't know. What I do know is this, is that under, uh, I believe, Gerald Ford, Edward Levy of the University of Chicago was made attorney general. He was an example of an attorney general who showed a respect and concern about the future and the history of the rule of law. I think Barack Obama is that kind of person as well, and I would urge him to do this. But you're absolutely right about the influence on a president. You know, when Barack was in the Senate, he had his liberal constituents back home in Illinois. He had to see guys like me every day, and, uh, you know, the, the progressive supporters of his wanted him to do this. Those were the inputs he had, and he was a very good senator on those. His day looks a little different now. I, 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 this is mythical, but I believe this is basically what happens. Eight o'clock in the morning, the CIA comes in and gives him a briefing. Then nine o'clock, the military comes in and gives him a briefing. Then I like to say at 11 o'clock, the Chicago boys come in and tell him what the good politics are. And then just before lunch, he sees the White House lawyer who says it's your job to preserve the maximum power of the presidency. A president, whoever he is, even my friend President Obama, needs to break through that although it's, I'm sure, very, very difficult. But it is an historic opportunity for him to restore the balance. It is understandable that the balance would change to a degree after an attack like 9-11. We had terrible mistakes made in this part of the country with Japanese Americans after World War II. These are tragic moments, but it's one thing that they happen right after a crisis. It's another thing if they're continued. 
And we're in a continuing situation here where the president should take the lead on changing. Let's talk about that other thing that you're most famous for. Um, what's the line? Uh, you, you have to tell it. Is that John McCain used yeah. to go around introducing you as? Yeah, well, his, uh, one thing Cindy McCain always says, which I love, is that, that John, uh, John has a number of jokes, and it's always exciting when he has a new one. She, she used to say that right in front of him. Well, one of the things John came up with early in our efforts on McCain Fine was, you know, people in Wisconsin think Russ's first name is McCain. Ah, you know. So he loves saying that, and frankly, it's, I get a lot of laughs repeating it, so I always do. But And yeah. it took how long for you it guys? Seven to, to eight years. Seven, yeah. seven, seven, seven and, got and a half it done. years, something like that. But it was, the reporters used to laugh at us. Whenever we'd lose a vote, we'd come out and say, we're going to win eventually. And uh, it, it finally came through. And one of the things that people don't realize is despite the outrageous decision in Citizens United, McCain-Feingold is still the law of the land. The main provision of McCain-Feingold is banning soft money to the parties. That's the law. But what the Supreme Court did in Citizens United is, is basically destroy all the rest of the laws that we built McCain-Feingold on, so its significance is Well, reduced. that's what I wanted to ask you about with Citizens United, and wh what's the practical effect of Citizens United? What has it been? What do you envision it to be? Um, is it, does it permit, I mean, as you say, McCain-Feingold is still the law of the land, but has Citizens United essentially created an end run? Has it oh, at, at a minimum. This is the way I describe it. McCain and I uh, saw a big brick wall of campaign finance laws, and we noticed that one of the bricks was gone. So we got a new brick, put it in there. Then somebody came along with a mallet and smashed the whole wall down. It was all broken except for the McCain final brick still intact. The wall doesn't do you much good anymore, right? That's what they did. They took a 1907 law, the Tillman Act, signed by a Republican president, Teddy Roosevelt, that reflected the, the wisdom of the American people after going through the robber baron era, saying, we're not going to let oil companies, timber companies, railroad companies use their treasuries to dominate our political campaign. So that's been the law of the land, essentially unquestioned, for over 100 years. Then in the 1940s, some of the business interests in the country saw the growing power of labor unions. And they said, well, if corporations can't do it, Unions shouldn't be able to do it either, so they passed the Taft-Hartley Act, which included a ban on using mandatory union dues. The Supreme Court, by a five to four vote, and Citizens United says, just kidding. So the way I explain it to people, and I've given this talk everywhere in this country, basically, is for the first time in our lifetimes, or anybody's lifetime who's alive now, when you buy a gallon of gas or a tube of toothpaste, that money can be now used in a political campaign against somebody you support. That was never, ever allowed. It's corporate treasury money, money from commerce, not from independently given permission for political contributions. So this uh, has created a mythical system of allegedly independent super PACs. And of course, they're not independent at all. When both sides did this, they essentially send their former chief of staff and legislative director over, and they create the super PAC. And they don't have to say anything to them. They don't even have to wink at them. They know exactly what, what they want done. And it's not independent at all. Justice uh, Ginsburg essentially pointed that out, that the, the court's assumption that this is sort of not corrupt and not uh, a, a, a collusion with a, essentially quid pro quo is a joke. And so they've roiled our system. It is vastly different than it was three years ago. And it's very sad and, and sort of, I think I know why it happened. I think the corporate world that wanted to play this game, a lot of the corporate world doesn't want anything to do with it, they managed to get the Supreme Court to do this for them because in 2004, 2006, and 2008, McCain-Feingold was in effect. You couldn't do this through the political parties. 527s tried to destroy the, the campaigns and they did the swift voting and all that, but the FEC actually cracked down on that, so they were being stopped. So what did people do? People were starting to turn to the internet People like Howard Dean, my campaign, the president's campaign, was able to raise large amounts of money from small contributions in a way that didn't involve politicians calling up and asking for money. It was sort of an electronic democracy. Things were much better. We had the genie back in the bottle. People say, well, money always finds a way. Well, it didn't find a way unless you, it found a way to the Supreme Court because the law was in a good place and we could move then on to hopefully to public financing 
and other things that we need to do to really fix the system. But the Supreme Court uh, Although your friend gutted McCain, our system. Your, your friend McCain doesn't, doesn't agree with you on public I don't speak for him. He doesn't speak for me. One of my long-term projects was. What's his opposition to it? He's of the well. I shouldn't speak for him. What Republicans usually say is that it's welfare for politicians. That's the little. They're very good at these phrases, but you know, I, I'll never give up on convincing John it's a good idea. You know, Arizona had had a good public financing system uh, for many years. Well, what's the answer to Citizens United? Is there an answer to Citizens? Yeah. Is 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 there a legislative fix, or is this is is this just now? baked into the Constitution. Well, think. it's not baked into the Constitution because it can be overturned. It was a 5-4 decision that most of the leading legal scholars in this country believe was a rotten decision. Poor law, poor precedent in terms of the use, the use of precedent. It was bad in every respect, both the results and its legal credibility. It directly overturned a provision of the McConnell decision from a few years earlier where Sandra Day O'Connor was the fifth vote in favor. So it was only a change of one person on the court and the legal reasoning in the thing is almost a joke. So it can be overturned, it will be overturned. The question is, how long? First thing that had to happen was the president be reelected. Next thing that has to happen is a vacancy of one of the five people that voted for it. When that happens, if it happens, is unclear. One of the things I like to kid about, because I don't want to be maudlin about this, is it doesn't require you know somebody going to the pearly gates. It, you know, the Pope quit. So a Supreme Court justice can quit, right? Um, maybe Hillary Clinton's gonna be the next president. My prediction is over the next five to six years, there will be new justices and it will be overturned. Having said that, it's not enough just to wait for that because it's really roiling the system. We can pass laws to make sure this information is disclosed. People aren't going to feel the full effect of citizens. What information exactly? Of, the, of these huge contributions. Okay. Because they're, he they're often hidden. The law does not, unless Congress passes a disclosure act, these contributions not only can be hidden, but are being hidden. This whole thing about the IRS, this had to do with organizations, and they, they should have been going after both sides, um, that take a lot of these organizations, not the ones necessarily that they went after, but a lot of them put huge amounts of corporate money into 501c4s pretending that they're not doing it for political reasons, which you're not supposed to do primarily, but they are. So essentially, we need to update that law and make, make that clear. But by disclosing these contributions, by making it clear who's giving 10 million and having some sense of why, this scandal will come out in the open. Here in California, uh, I've worked very closely with the Clean Elections Campaign. I've done fundraisers for them. We are only one or two votes away from getting this through the California legislature, and I know Governor Brown would sign it. So in this uh, great state with the most people and the most money, we think that this is the place uh, where we can help really get the ball rolling. In New York, a different approach. New York City has uh, the best public financing law in the country, it works very well. We want Governor Cuomo to do it statewide. So my organization, Progressives United, which is very involved on this issue, tries to operate in terms of educating the public and litigation strategy to overturn the decision, federal legislation, state legislation, everything we can do to let people know that this is in effect the 800 pound gorilla in the room because both parties, uh, jumped in the swimming pool on this thing. I'm mixing analogies with the gorillas in swimming pools, but, <laughs> but you get the idea that it's this big thing that nobody's willing to take on. But yet the public knows that there's something rotten in Denmark here. Now it's Danish swimming pools. Danish with swimming pools gorillas with gorillas. Yeah. <laughs> that well, we want to change that imagery as fast <laughs> as we can. Um, what is the future of American politics? I realize that's a huge, <laughs> ridiculously huge question, but you've been through the wars now. You've, you've, you've won a lot, and the last time you lost. And um, one of the things that really comes through in the book, uh, which you're obviously very, very proud of, is the fact that you did uh, what you call listening sessions throughout Wisconsin. And uh, remind me what the pledge was. The pledge That, was that I would go to every Wisconsin county, and there's 72 of them, every year and hold a town meeting, an open town meeting where anybody could come. And you kept that pledge, you kept that Almost pledge? Almost 1,300 of them. 1,300. In the beginning, and for a lot of years, they were very civil 16 affairs. years worth. Very, very yeah. civil affairs. They'd come, they yeah. would, they, they were a little hesitant to I, talk it was the People were so nice that once in a while I liked it when a guy roughed me up a little bit to make it a little more interesting, you know, sort of 
gave me a hard time. Some people would boo him. I'd say, oh, come on. But you'd have, but you had no shortage of that by the end. Can you just describe that well, a little bit? I mean, what, sadly, what happened? What happened? Barack Obama became president. Within days of the inauguration of that new president, who won overwhelmingly, things turned nasty. People started showing up with hats that I thought they were fishing hats, new kind of fishing hat, with tea bags coming off them. And they started saying that the president was a socialist. They started saying that he wanted to have a panels, the death panels. They were making up absolute malarkey about what was going to be in the health care bill, what it was going to do. It was incredible. It, it was, and people in Wisconsin are so polite. It was very surprising to see a tactic that was clearly meant to shut down the town meetings. And we didn't have to look too far. We found, and I have it in my book, While America Sleeps, there's actually a little memo created by a guy in Connecticut, how you can disrupt a town meeting and how you can make the elected representative never want to do them again. Um, so they, they, you know, I was the uh, guy that was uh, very uh, perfect target because I had made this promise. They knew I was going to do it. Doing it for, yeah. You'd been doing and it for I, decades. I wasn't going to stop. I took my medicine. Uh, it was very harsh. There were times when I couldn't even you know, say what I wanted to say because of the chanting and so on. But I figured, you know what? People gave me 16 years of good meetings. I can take a couple years of bad meetings. <laughs> but it was, it was unfortunate. And I, it scared away the people, a lot of the people who came just to talk and were polite and, you know, whether whatever their political view, they, they made them uncomfortable in the room. It had a feel of, of, of almost being a little dangerous at times, not to me personally, but it just seemed like, um, you know, people in Wisconsin don't generally like that sort of thing. So they were smart enough to know that people would start staying away if, if they felt that people were going to be yelling at each other. That's not what people wanted to do. Uh, Short-term phenomenon or sea change? Short-term phenomenon, uh, I think. I think that, that groups may try these tactics again. But I think this time uh, the majority of people who don't believe in these kind of tactics will not put up with it. They will come to a meeting and say, cut it out. But because it was so new, I think people felt intimidated and didn't know how to sort of demand that their neighbors cut it out and, and be polite to each other. That, that's all we can ask. Obviously, you can't ask that people don't get mad and be feel strongly, but to, to, to be very rough on, I, mean, they, I remember one guy at one town meeting said he had a bad heart condition and he couldn't get any insurance and they started yelling at him. It, it was just, I was kind of surprised. So if there were uh, a young state senator in, in Wisconsin who wanted to pick up on your idea of these listening sessions, <laughs> you wouldn't say, hey, listen, it was a great idea and it's time, but it, that's passed. Uh, this, it, 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 no, know, I wouldn't. I, I would tell him to do some open meetings. Uh, of course, now, which I didn't have that, really the ability to do um, when I first became a, in politics, you can do you know, electronic meetings. So I would never eliminate the face-to-face -face meetings completely. But you can do them in different ways, and if it's clear that people are going to disrupt uh, announce meetings, you can have other types of sessions. But I, I do think there, there is still a place, hopefully, in American politics for open forums where everybody's invited and everybody behaves. But if the ground rules aren't respected of, of being polite to each other, then something else has to be developed. But I wouldn't tell people not to try it. Uh, I think maybe people realize it kind of backfired in the Tea Party. They didn't have a good election last time. No. I, reading the book, it, it really seems as if a, a lot of your fondest memories from public service came from those listening oh, yeah. sessions. I, I mean, love the you, people. You, I mean, <laughs> almost every almost every chapter starts yeah. and ends yeah. with, a, with a listening session. Well, we and they're not always favorable. No. I mean, they're, they're, a lot of what you cite is that people getting up and excoriating you for yeah. X, Y, or Z. Um, but... Well, I love people. I love people in Wisconsin in particular. I love the way Wisconsin looks and the different parts of the state. I enjoyed it that I kind of knew a lot about the little area and I knew people there. It was, it was. Well, you made a whole thing. I, oh yeah, the, the Wisconsin's the shape of my hand. Yeah, yeah. Russ Feingold knows Wisconsin <laughs> like, like the, he knows the back yeah. of his hand, and right? I and I do, and I and you know that doesn't mean you get a lifetime guarantee of getting reelected, but it does mean I love the state and I love talking to people, and um, you know that's that. I, somebody asked me earlier today, do I like teaching? Yes, very much. One thing I do miss though is that kind of uh, encounter with people in a more casual way. Um, that where they're just sort of telling their elected representative what they feel. Yeah. So, yeah, there were some tough moments, but overall, a lot of laughs, a lot of great ideas, 
a lot of really bright, impressive people who normally would have no chance to talk to their senator, but because of this system, they can come every year to every county and talk to their senator, for, as I said, for, some a, of them did. for a minute or two. Oh yeah, there were people who came every year. And the sad thing about the Tea Party disrupting is some of those people no longer felt safe or comfortable being there. You not only love Wisconsin, there's a particular Wisconsin, well, there's more than one, but there was one in particular that you really patterned yourself after, and that was fighting Bob LaFollette, the Wisconsin senator from, and leading progressive from turn of, uh, kind of turn of the 20th century, from the 19th right. to the 20th century. Um, is there a future for progressivism in the United States? Um, some people would say, well, you know, there's a reason that the progressives were so popular going from the 19th to the 20th century. You had, you know, uh, this massive uh, increase in population. Living conditions were different. You needed to regulate the railroads. And, and, you know, the railroads aren't what they once were, and they're not in need of regulation in the same way that they were uh, at the turn of the century. Um, is there a place for progressivism now, or is it, is it, is it nostalgia? Not at all. The Gilded Age was a reaction, uh, the progressive movement was a reaction to the Gilded Age. The domination of our economy and our government by corporate big business power. This is the Gilded Age on steroids. Now companies who in the past would have at least needed American workers and American farmers, they don't even need them anymore. They can shift resources overseas. This is why I so vigorously opposed these trade agreements that gutted our Wisconsin jobs in, in the Fox River Valley in Milwaukee. So actually, what we have here with the combination of Wall Street, Citizens United, and all the other ways in which corporations have both parties bought off, what we have here is a, an open invitation to a stronger progressive movement fueled also by the fact that we have many new people in this country, many new immigrant populations who if we can, they can see, and working people here can see the common ground that they have with the growing gap between the wealthy and the poor in this country. It, the, the conditions are perfect in some ways for a new progressive movement. And I think that the elect, re-election of Barack Obama against somebody who typified the robber baron mentality of the 19th century is a sign that people get it uh, now. Can we get that kind of turnout again in elections? We don't know. But if we can, it can be the foundation, not just to reelect one good guy, but the foundation of a real new progressive movement. So I think the conditions are ripe, and I predict in the next 10 to 20 years there will be that kind of a movement in this country. Who were you personally close to in the United States Senate? Well, I was close to John McCain. We got along very well. You were close to John Ashcroft. I was very friendly with John. Or at least John. you were yeah. on very I mean, good I, I liked John as a person. He was a, we had a fun sort of relationship in terms of our enormous philosophical differences, but he was very polite. But I got along with him extremely well. I, I really, really enjoyed working with Bob Carey, uh, Maria Cantwell of Washington, the wonderful colleague who's one of the best people I've ever worked with, very bright and uh, very honest. Um, Dick Durbin, I always great sense of humor. Chuck Schumer uh, is an extremely talented guy, and then Harry Reid, the majority leader, is one of my favorite people. People think, how did he become the leader? Well, when you see Harry operate uh, and his skill and his judgment of people, he's a very impressive guy with a very wicked sense of humor. He. Uh, one time, uh, I was out on the floor of the Senate. I was getting ready to give a speech, and I had my uh, speech all ready and everything. And, I thought, oh, I better go to the restroom first. So I come back and I see through the window, he's throwing my speech in the garbage, in the, in the wastebasket. I come back and he said, I said, Harry, why did you do that? He goes, you don't need notes, just talk. <laughs> I mean, I really cherish those that had a little humor in the Senate and, and Harry was one of them. Well, speaking of humor, there was, I don't know if you were particularly close to Carl Levin, but there was, um, uh, there was a moment during, uh, <laughs> could you just, uh, <laughs> President Clinton is on trial, and uh, he's been impeached by the House, and now he's on trial in the Senate, and you're in the back benches talking with somebody. Yeah. What happens? Well, yeah, this is a story that's better. I'd probably better leave it in writing, but I'll, I'll tell it. Um, so I was trying to illustrate in the book that while bin Laden was basically planning to blow up Americans in Tanzania and Kenya and wherever, 
we're having a six or seven week impeachment trial. And at first everybody was very serious, but it went on for all day, every day, including Saturdays for about five weeks, about five weeks in, and they only gave us 45 minutes for lunch. About five weeks in, we're coming back from lunch and I'm in the back of the room chatting with Bob Carey and Paul Wellstone. And we're kind of yucking it up, you know, trying to get a few laughs. And all of a sudden, Carl Levin, with a very serious look on his face, he's probably the best lawyer in the Senate, he's got those little readers, and he's got a piece of paper and notes. He comes kind of running to the back, and he goes, you guys, I, I have a kind of a uh, uh, embarrassing question. He goes, yeah, I, I just, I, I don't, and I'm not trying. He says, he says, what's a thong? A and thong. A thong. And uh, Wellstone and I couldn't breathe. We, we dissolved in laughter. And I choked out the words to Bob Kerry, Bob, I think you should handle this. So as we walked away, he's got his arm around a very red-faced Carl Levin, who's having uh, what a thong is, explained to him as the Chief Justice is gaveling us back <laughs> into order. Uh, obviously not something yeah, I You had to be there, huh? Had to be there. I, yeah. um, not something I revealed till I left the Senate. I hope Carl will speak to me again. but. It was unbelievable to think that we were sitting on the floor of the United States Senate having that conversation instead of, about that instead of focusing on the issues that our country faced. You spent 18 years in the United States Senate. Did it change, did the institution or the ways that the institution ran, did they change much during those 18 years? Did you perceive that? Oh, dramatically. Oh. Um, when I got there, bills would come up and uh, first of all, there were a lot of bipartisan efforts. There was real pride in people working together. Bills would come up and, you know, we'd, majority leader it was George Mitchell or Bob Dole would say, who's got an amendment? And you raise your hand and, and you'd just go through the amendment. So when it was over, you'd have a vote. Sure, there were filibusters, but they were very rare. I mean, one time I did a filibuster to protect the Wisconsin dairy industry because Pat Leahy and the guys in New England were trying to do something bad to us. So I had my staff get me some uh, Recipe, cheese recipes in the history of cheese book. And I got out there and Camembert is the king of cheeses. It was used in ancient Egypt or whatever. Must see TV. Yeah, yeah. you know, it's, it's, oh, you really must yeah. watch it. Yeah. Um, you know, this was a rare thing. Now it's used in 70% of the cases for partisan reasons. It was not used for partisan reasons when we first got to the Senate. So this this is a dramatic change, and it's one of the reasons the Senate is in such disrepute right now. I teach a course at Stanford Law School, and I taught it at Marquette about the Senate as a legal institution. And we begin with the, with the central myth of the Senate. It's probably a myth. And that is that George Washington told Thomas Jefferson that the Senate was supposed to be the cooling saucer. He would actually poured, supposedly, the coffee into his saucer. He'd say It's to be the cooling saucer to the House. That's the, uh, something that senators are proud of. One of my students at Marquette in the law school class said, you know, maybe it's supposed to be a cooling saucer, but it seems more like the deep freezer now, <laughs> which I thought was a brilliant remark because that's what's happened. And that is a huge change from 1993. Is there a fix for that? Yes. What they were trying to do, uh, Senators Merkley of Oregon and Udall of Colorado, was really a modest change, which they should have done. It wasn't until 1975 that it was possible to do a so-called silent or stealth filibuster. In other words, where you don't have to talk. Yeah. What's wrong with making people talk? That, that was sort of the original idea, is that you deliberate, not that you sit in your office and you know, have a sandwich and, and tell the majority leader that, that you're filibustering. That could easily be changed. I don't think you need to destroy the whole filibuster rule, and I don't think we should. But that would change it because if just you have make to make them get up there and actually if you have talk. To believe me, if no bathroom break. If senators have to actually talk, then they're not so interested in doing it. If all they have to do is have a staff member call up the majority leader and say, "Hey, I'm filibustering," and then go home, that's a whole different ballgame. One of your uh, law school classmates, um, who was also a guest on this program, Scott Turo when he heard that uh, I was going to be interviewing you, said, please, please, Evan, ask him when he's going to run for governor because Wisconsin needs him. Oh, I thought he was going to ask me to run for governor of Illinois. That's where he's from. Uh, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think he, he, he uh, thought that you'd meet the qualifications there. But, uh, <laughs> ah, Ten miles away in Janesville, Wisconsin. And I'm a White Sox fan. Um, look. What would you Running for about? office is not the only thing a person can do in their life. I had several opportunities to run for governor. Uh, I preferred the legislative role. 
I'm not saying I would never ever run for governor, but it, there have been a number of occasions where I might have looked at it and it just didn't seem like the right fit for my interests and my skills. Um, maybe that would be different later in my life. But You don't it, want to be a manager? I can't say that. It's just that I have got such a commitment now to issues like civil liberties, uh, some of the foreign policy issues, issues that have to do with um, a lot of the challenges in, in the intelligence community, that those are things that I feel that I have a real head start on. And I would be more likely to want to continue that work, whether in elective office or not. Um, you, at the beginning, you presented the different sort of phases of my life. I never thought of it that way. But in a way, there is some truth to that. Having gone through 9-11, having really worked on trying to, I, I see a huge gap there. Be, being governor of a state wouldn't allow you to engage in foreign policy in the yeah. same way that. It's not just that. It's, it's that I have a head start on trying to understand these other issues. I love Wisconsin. There are things I'd like to do uh, to help Wisconsin solve some of its serious problems. But I think at the moment, my mindset is one that, that really feels I need to do more uh, in some kind of public service, maybe not elective office, to try to help us get a better understanding of the rest of the world. I just see that as a, a huge problem. Maybe I'll have a different attitude in a few years, but not for 2014. Senator Russ Feingold, thank you for speaking thank you. legally. It's great to be here.